preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. I want to welcome you here this evening to this last um, panel discussion in the series The New Jewish Culture, Problems and Prospects, which has been a co-sponsored series of the 92nd Street Y and the Radius Institute. Um, tonight, moderating the series, the evening, and the individual who will introduce our very distinguished guests and speakers who we're very privileged to have here at the Y is the director of the Radius Institute, uh, a unique person in American Jewish life, and a colleague in developing this series, uh, Rabbi Steve Shaw. I think according to Jewish theology, everyone is a unique person, so. The 60s were a particularly controversial decade, perhaps like the 20s in cultural terms and like the 30s in political ones, meaning that they were radically challenging the worldview that preceded it. Consider attitudes toward patriotism, sexuality, the relationship between men and women, the work ethos. All of these have been areas of sharp debate since the 1960s. Jews, of course, are not isolated from general cultural trends. To the contrary, many of the most articulate and at times vociferous voices advocating radical change were themselves Jewish. Within the Jewish community, religiously the challenges ranged from Kabbalah and the controversial rhetoric of the Freedom Seder to varieties of neo-traditionalism, including serious encounters with traditional Torah study by non-Orthodox Jews and the Baal Tshuva phenomena or return to orthodox observance. Politically, the Jewish 60s included a new militancy on behalf of Soviet Jewry, an open protest against Federation priorities, and public dissent on Israeli policies. Over the past two decades, a number of major Jewish periodicals have represented almost antithetical points of view in seeing the 60s through Jewish lenses. Many contributors to commentary have vehemently reacted to what they saw were the 60s lack of cultural and intellectual standards and communal discipline. On the other hand, Shema, along with Moment, can be seen as periodical of the 60s. It has provided a lively forum where the periods ferment has frequently found expression. Thus, both the Radius Institute and the 92nd Street Y particularly pleased that tonight's two speakers have played such important roles in shaping each of these two very different periodicals. On the one hand, commentary, and the other, Shema. For two decades, Milton Himmelfarb on my left has, or has been one of commentary's most incisive essayists and cultural critics. For me and for many of my contemporaries, it was reading Milton Himmelfarb in commentary which set the standards for thoughtful and sophisticated Jewish engagement with general culture. While Shema magazine lacks commentary's length, circulation, and friends in high places, it does appear twice as frequently, is much easier to read cover to cover, and unlike commentary, it also has a Purim issue. Seriously, Jean Borowitz's, Jean Borowitz, Schmas founder and editor, is a kind of hero for many of us. I admire Jean for his intellectual lucidity and also because he's one of the handful of individuals who has created and sustained an independent Jewish institution, Schma Magazine, for more than 15 years. Finally, a role about, a word about Radius's role and the 92nd Street Y in working with Radius and bring a sense of responsibility and duty when it comes to Jewish procreation. Now, you think that's going to come out of physicality and corporeality? What you're going to get out of physicality and materiality is bigger and better orgasms. 
You don't want better sex. What you want is kids. A kid is a nuisance. A kid is a major responsibility, may interfere with all kinds of things. The question is, where is this generation, or any generation, going to get the sense that they must reverse what the culture tells them? The culture tells them, be comfortable. Where are these people supposed to learn that they're supposed to be uncomfortable? This culture tells them, be a vulgar Philistine middle brow. You want them to be high intellectuals? After all, they're Jewish, aren't they? This culture tells them, what are you kids for? You want them to have children, lots of children. Now, where is that sense of duty to come from? Now, look, when it comes to French, Milton, I confess <laughs> you may be my instructor. But when it comes to Jewish theology, dear friend, the notion that somehow Jewish theology has something to do with spirituality and isn't intimately connected to the problem of authority in a non-orthodox age, in an age when we cannot be commanded by the written word, when we cannot simply be commanded by what our parents did, because a lot of it was thinking, in an age in which our institutions can't command us because they are very often rotten, in order for people to once again find a sense of Jewish responsibility to sanctify the material, you need to believe in something. Moreover, you need to believe in something transcendent of the material, the corporeal, in order to take the corporeal from what nature tells you to do and to transform it. That is the function of Jewish theology. That is precisely what it seems to me in my second comment, you haven't addressed yourself to. So far, you have been spending your time saying, gee, isn't it kind of nice we now have a whole generation of people who are not self-hating. But in fact, what you had was a nuclear group who created a style of intensive Jewish living. It wasn't just being spiritual and floating around in the air and writing trendy poetry. It was, in fact, an effort to accumulate mitzvot. What's the Jewish catalog about? Spirituality. Indeed, the criticism of the Jewish catalog was it was so busy doing things all the time. It was a how-to guide to Judaism. And it was precisely not only creating a Jewish way of life, but a Jewish way of life in community. So one wasn't simply going around doing this thing by oneself, but one had to get involved with other Jews and building now a certain kind of institutional life. Now to do that, you need to know what you believe. Ergo, you really do think these are a wonderful bunch of kids, don't you? Who face the problem of trying to give Jews a new modern sense of duty and you really admire very much the way in which, unlike their parents, they decided to take God, the relationship between God and the Jewish people, and the Jewish tradition seriously enough to build their lives on it, except that you ran out of time before you had a chance to say that, right? I try to suggest, uh, Gene, that I would be... <laughs> I'm sorry, is there a good pothole lawyer? In the yeah. <laughs> I twisted my ankle on an uneven sidewalk yesterday, and I want to sue for $14 million at least. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a water freak. I did not mean that as a threatening gesture, believe me. We frisked both of them before they came on stage. Uh, I, I suspect, Gene, that at least implicitly, you have a notion of theology that is far broader and more tenuous than mine. I know of people who acted in a way self-sacrificially for higher purposes in obedience to transcendent commands, or they wouldn't have called them transcendent, who are declared atheists. I'm thinking of the people who founded the kibbutzim. Uh, life in the early kibbutz was much less comfortable than the bourgeois life which those people could have aspired to. 
Especially was this true of kibbutz women as opposed to their bourgeois sisters, whether in Warsaw or in London or, uh, or, or in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, where I grew up as a boy. They had no, tr they didn't think of themselves as being transcendent, but they were sacrificing present good and comfort for a greater purpose. Now, the question therefore addresses itself to us when we, or we, we must address the question when we consider the people you're talking about, how serious are they indeed, and I thought I had made that somewhat explicit, how serious are they indeed when in observing their acts we find that actually they are not sacrificing themselves terribly much. When it would seem a fair or even unfair, but nevertheless not terribly wide of the mark way of describing their behavior as saying that they are engaging in just another, in one or another form of essentially hedonistic, quotes, self-realization, close quotes, behaviors of the kind, uh, I'm sorry, I'm an outsider to this. Uh, if, if I mention Village Voice, would that be appropriate? If I mention Mother Jones, would that be appropriate? I, I, I read neither, so I'm trying to grope for what it would be. A kind of style of life self-realization business. Accompanied by characteristic careers in the academy, and as far as I know, characteristic childlessness. I consider this to be the justification for a certain suspicion about the true basis of a religious or theological motivation. I would be more convinced having children and uh, you know taking care of diapers and worrying about fevers in the night and things of that when they're very young and when they're growing up a little, worrying about bad companions and all the rest of it. Gene, you know that's, that's not easy. Which is why, in a way, Gene, I think that by the test of time, your Baal Teshuvah, or your Orthodox, will turn out more likely to be the winners, if only in a Darwinian sense. Well, listen, Milton, uh, there are two problems, it seems to me, with what you are uh, saying. Uh, one, I think we are talking about different groups of people. Uh, you seem to have in mind some rather broad-scale phenomenon called the younger generation now come into their 30s. I'm talking rather specifically about the people associated with the nuclear creation of a Jewish religious style in the Chavura uh, movement as most typically exemplified by Chavura Shalom in uh, Somerville and the New York Chavura, the kind of people who uh, were grouped around a response magazine in the very earliest days, uh, a, a group that was roughly estimated to be about 50 or 75 people out of whose creative energies came a new Jewish style. Now, I don't think you're addressing that. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me you're talking about another group and you're talking about the generation generally, and I don't think we're going to get anywhere with that. I do, however, want to deal with the intellectual issue because that's quite critical to me. Uh, in the first place, you think that the people who started the kibbutz movement didn't have a transcendent ideal? It was called socialism. And it was because socialism rejected reality that they built it. Now, the problem was that in a previous generation, that's exactly what these kids discovered. In a previous generation, it was pro possible to have a secular transcendent ideal. It is the collapse of secularism, of simple human rationalism as commanding, which they pick up and understand. It is therefore a rejection of all those theories of Judaism, which are simply humanistic, because they can no longer command. That is why, at the moment, you don't have a great 
outflow of energy on the part of socialists to build new uh, activities, and there is no secular, transcendent ideal which generates passion to any considerable extent. That there are individuals around, that there will be residual uh, carryovers in our society for a long period of time, that's perfectly clear. But what the, these kids picked up at the late 1960 was the loss of the old secular ground of value. And when they became interested in the religious life, not in theology, that's why Steve Cohen criticized them and said, we've got to create a theology. They were interested in theology. They were interested in once again latching on to God and latching on to God in such a way that they would have to do something. And that did take sacrifice because that group was willing to take on mitzvot. They were willing, some of them, to take on mikveh, and that is a sacrifice. They were willing to take on kashrut, and speaking of all your mimi sheraton, you know, people, that is a sacrifice by that standard. Now, I think we need to give that group their due, but I think you and I are talking about different groups, and that's why we have difficulty we joining on this issue. We're not talking about using different words. Yeah, maybe. I've never heard of a socialist or a Marxist who would admit to you that he was following a transcendent ideal. What do you transcendent think? Transcendent is one of these idealistic theological words which my Marxist materialism comes to abolish. Yeah, so Marxist materialism, the idea of Marxist materialism is itself materialistic. Well, okay. how, are you going to, how are you going to characterize how a Marxist looks at the world? As materialism? To the contrary, any intellectual of whom I consider you to be one of the best, will recognize that the notion of Marxist materialism is itself a product of German idealism. Hegel stood on his head, therefore a transcendent ideal. But the defense of theology rests. Let me go back to what I said about a comparison group, the orthodox. And again, let me give you some statistics, though I won't uh, burden you with actual numbers. You spoke, about, uh, by the way, incidentally, you unfairly characterized my, my comparison of the 80 freshmen with the 69 freshmen. I did not say that they were less ethical. I said that they engaged less in self-realization and service to humanity talk. That does not necessarily mean they are less no, ethical. No, I certainly agree. Now, there have been recent pieces of research published in a book edited by Paul Rudiband, whom you know. Very well. About studies, especially in Israel, where there are good census data. And these studies show that year of education for year of education, comparing university graduates with other university graduates. Or th therefore, right, eliminating secondary sociological things like uh, recency of immigration, belonging to the Moroccans, uh, backward communities and so on. Comparing Western type university educated people in Israel the Shomrei Mitzvot, the Orthodox, have on average one child more than the non orthodox Of course, they have a transcendent ideal which tells them. Exactly. Now what do we do, Milton, like you and me, when you and I can't be Orthodox? Where does the sense of authority come from? Or are you going to force them that's in that box which says, gee, uh, the only way to handle this is to return to orthodoxy, no, because only orthodoxy can produce a transcendent ideal. No. These kids tried to find an in-between way. Now, Gene, it, it, it isn't very complicated. You tell me that you're a good patriotic Jew and you're prepared to make sacrifices for a Jewish future? Prove it. Have children. Have that patriotic child. Uh, it, you, it's not terribly complicated. Sure it is. It is the notion that somehow you will move people against their perceived self-duty in the name of patriotism. The idea that somehow loyalty to the Jewish people should require you to do this sort of thing is itself no longer compelling. 
You see, Mordecai Kaplan's notion that somehow the folk had a right to make demands on us will take us to a certain extent. No, Gene, but I'm when it comes to a matter of this deep personal significance and sacrifice, simple patriotism and the demands of the group will no longer come us. I was us. accepting your, the terms of your reference, the terms of your, of your reference sure, being God talk. Yes. If you are admitting some kind of response to God's voice, then part of that response is a future for the Absolutely. Jewish, a future for Absolutely. the Jewish people. I certainly agree. And a future. And that for the, hasn't been heard in Israel. A future for the Jewish people is inconceivable without Jews without to any be a Jewish question. people. Okay, since we have no questions, um, I'd like to open it up. And we think they should go out and have kids, right, Milton? I've had mine. <laughs> I have a few testimonials here this evening. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we'd like um, we'd like to open up the issues to the audience for some questions, if you'd like to ask them. Uh, uh, Barry, Barry Holtz. Want to stand up, please? Oh, sure, I'd love to. Uh, uh, Kaplan and Heschel are uh, well known in the Jewish community, and they both stand as uh, Buber certainly doesn't for being Jewish. Buber has been widely dismissed, particularly in the conservative movement, as for Gentiles. He's a theologian for Christians, and therefore one doesn't really pay much attention to him. So that any effort to become, so to speak, more Jewish will ne necessarily latch on to the the two theologians who seem to represent being more Jewish. But neither the Kaplanian, nor in some cases, I think in many cases, the Heschelian answer will do. Why? Because Kaplan doesn't understand even what it means to have a community. When Kaplan uses the word community, he means how to organize institutions, how to have an organic interrelation so that various kinds of functions are carried out under a central community goal. Nothing could be further from the Chavura idea. The Chavura is precisely semi-anti-organizational, interpersonal, face-to-face. Now, whether the group understands that that's Buber or not doesn't make much difference because, in fact, Buber came into the Jewish community through American culture. If one watches the way the folk songs change and a whole new style of popular music comes into the 60s, it is music which talks about being a person. If when around you, you hear people start talking about not being treated like objects and learning how to, in this marvelous verb, to relate to one another. What in fact is you are dealing with Buber and acting out Buber whether one knows it or not. Now the problem then becomes, and this is I think uh, what is true in almost every movement. A good movement will do what Milton says. It will live first and think second. And the living was what was so beautiful here. The whole notion, take, take what Rosenzweig did. He stopped doing philosophy in order to live as a Jew. And of all things, to be a Jewish educator. 
Can you imagine a German philosopher who gives up the possibility of being a professor, an ordinarius yet, in order to be a melamed, as he was willing to do? And Rosenzweig did that, and that's what this group did. It tried to show how to live as a Jew. And what I'm saying is the time comes now to pick up the inherent contradictions here and to carry them forward. The difficulty with Heschel, since I left that out, is that Heschel understands that there is a God who commands us, but he understands that in an orthodox way. And the difficulty then is how, if you have this ambivalent relationship to the tradition, can you both have the relationship and be commanded and yet be free to make the changes you need? And that has to go the way of Rosenzweig and Buber and not of Kaplan and Heschel. Yes? That's always a good question. I once asked Dan, El Dan LSR how he would characterize Jewish professors five, eight years ago with Jewish professors 40 years earlier. He says 40 years early, earlier, 98% of Jewish professors were non-Jewish Jews. Now, says he, the condition is much better. Only 75% are non-Jewish Jews. Now, 75% is better than 98, but it still leaves uh, quite a distance to go. Your question about those others, they're really not new. You know, that, that, has, that we've had from the very beginning of Jewish modernity. There is a specific thing now with cults. I would say that the popularity of cults is the most striking proof of what Jean said about the collapse of, uh, of all kinds of secularisms, including uh, Marxism, Marxist pie in the sky. If you don't have Marxist pie in the sky, then Hare Krishna will do. Or to continue, in order to bring the Messiah, you know that in order to bring redemption to the world, it helps to attribute a quotation to the person who first said it. We are told that in the Talmud. Let me quote Maurice Friedberg, a professor of Russian at the University of Illinois. We were talking about the, Har the Jews in Hare Krishna and the paradox that it's precisely the grandchildren of Jews who abolished Hebrew in the liturgy and abolished chanting, both Hebrew and chanting as being too oriental. Their grandchildren dress in yellow robes and chant in Sanskrit. Maurice Friedberg said, that's what happens. You abolish Krishna, and you chant in honor of Krishna. <laughs> or, again, someone, Phil Baum said, his father held on to Kashrut, and he himself, if only out of filial piety rather than out of uh, obedience to God's command, also observes Kashrut. His father's brother, Phil Baum's uncle, denounced his brother for being inconsistent and for irrationally continuing an old, primitive, barbaric custom against all reason. Phil Baum's uncle abolished kashrut in his house. Phil Baum's cousins don't observe kashrut. They just observe organic food. 
Organic food is uh, the return of the repressed, isn't it? It's another form of kashrut. It's bringing a sacral attitude toward food. There is something in human beings which, which likes this sort of thing. So what I'm saying is that, sir, the new thing is precisely the phenomenon we're talking about. What you brought up is not new. That we've had for as long as we wish. Uh, Achad Ha'am is full of it. Before Achad Ha'am, uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch was full of it. It goes as far back as there have been modern Jews. The new thing is precisely what Gene Barowitz has been talking about tonight, and that is the hopeful sign, despite all the criticisms and reservations that nasty people like me make of them. Though tonight, as I say, I'm in a nice mood. Beth, me? I think I hinted at that when I spoke about a certain ingratitude. I didn't want to make it much more explicit than that. But uh, I, I, I feel that there is a duty owed of a, forgive me, a doubly patriotic kind. One toward Israel, and I'm not speaking now as Hawk or as Dove, but really taking Israel terribly seriously. And another toward the United States really is the champion of freedom in the world against precisely that horror that the prophet Micah so presciently warned us about by God 25, 2800 years ago. I didn't want to pound away at that because that might have been distractingly political. But uh, yes, I believe that there has been a certain kind of easygoing uh, assumption of the dominant uh, cultural political tone of uh, the, the, the non-Jewish peers or the non-Jewish Jewish peers of these people and a certain kind of essentially oh anti-American punk third world you know progressive outlook on the world which I think uh, should be reconsidered I'm, um, I'm sitting here trying to figure out why I don't want to answer your question. Because I think what I have to say is somewhat ungrateful. Uh, namely, really you don't have enough to do trying to figure out how to make the Chavura mo uh, movement work any place except the Upper West Side of New York and the college campus. Uh, 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 that's not enough to try to uh, figure out how, when we need some kind of institutionalization, uh, to keep a real sense of community. Now, I, I would, boy, I would be quite happy to have somebody settle that problem. But then to load on the backs of that the whole global, historic, cosmic agenda of Judaism, namely to bring the Messiah. And right now, if I say, don't do that, I'm going to tell you not to bring the Messiah right now, what kind of a Jew am I? On the other hand, 
to feel that the genius of this movement has to be extended to everything, otherwise it has accomplished nothing, is I think a little too much. Now maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe there are more uh, resources there and there's more understanding there uh, 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 and it is just that I'm getting old and tired. But uh, I think I would be quite satisfied to see what has been started continue and work out and become a living reality, not now in a generation which is uh, aging, but transmitted to other people and integrated somehow in the way that those of us who are made more staid and square could somehow make part of our lives. Gene, one of the, um, the striking features of this new culture, whatever it is, is that it seems to reject the denominational labels of orthodox conservative reform, um, but that puts it in an odd kind of stance because those are just the groups that have formed the organizational matrices that allowed them to continue. How do you think that this group can continue without um, parallel matri organizational matrices? Do they have to really form their own? Is, is that the wrong way to go? Do they have the ability to form their own? I mean, you know how difficult it is to form a small magazine. It can, uh, uh, although we have no organization. Um, and one of the purposes of running Shema, the way uh, uh, I have run it over the years is to prove that you can actually have something go on in the Jewish community which not only doesn't have an organization except such as required by the New York State law of nonprofit educational corporations which we minimally meet uh, 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 which never uh, uh, has a convention which has no resolutions which doesn't even have an office I mean it is possible to do that you do have to be crazy but uh, uh, it is possible so at least Somebody's done it. Uh, uh, only 12 and a half years. We are just celebrating our female maturity. 12 years, six months in a day. And that's uh, uh, the state we have reached. Uh, but I, uh, uh, you see, that's why I would prefer to discuss theology. Theology doesn't know denominational labels. It knows positions, intellectual Jewish positions. And I would hope what the group would continue to do would be to infiltrate and continue the process which now makes these labels increasingly insignificant and unimportant except insofar as you run across the problem of mass. In most Chavu wrote, as the numbers of people rise from 20 couples, to 35 couples or somewhere there, you get involved in a problem of critical mass. And it's no longer the same. We no longer feel toward one another the way we used to feel toward one another. In the good old days when we had started, we were like, see? Now, how many 20, 25 couple groups will you need to reach out to any significant nucleus in American Jewry? The critical problem comes then, how to, if I may say so, infiltrate and take over through ideology and example and thereby transform the existing institutional structures. There's a bad precedent for that. <laughs> that is a failed precedent. You mentioned Mordecai Kaplan. He's yeah. over a century old, may he live to 120 and six weeks. I once asked my son, why the six weeks? He said, so it shouldn't be too subtle. <laughs> now Mordecai Kaplan always had, <laughs> I like that. Mordecai Kaplan always had a notion of reconstructionism as being a state of mind and not an institution. It ended up as an institution. There's now a reconstructionist rabbinical college and it is a would-be fourth denomination in, in Jewish life. Uh, it, Maybe the time comes when the, the horror of institutionalization becomes uh, an irresistible temptation. I don't know. Now, there's another thing I want to uh, report on this business about the small groups and so on. My daughter told me this. She, uh, for a while, be when she was still in Philadelphia, belonged to that chavara that Art Green had started around the university there. When I was young, 
There used to be a song, wedding bells are breaking up that old gang of mine. And to summarize what Martha reported, it's the divorce courts are breaking up that old chavura of mine. Apparently, there is a very substantial amount of, uh, you know, the, the, the malaise affecting all educated American society. And uh, these advanced Jewish young people do not seem to respond to life's problems very significantly differently from advanced Episcopalian young people or Presbyterian young people or nowadays even advanced Catholic young people. That troubles you, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to make sure the observer and the moralist are very clearly distinguished here because you don't like that and you really wish that I somehow re I there were a it. sense of yeah there were a sense of idealism which would get them to overcome it even somehow to be able to once again try to sanctify divorce in a Jewish way you see suppose we have to live with divorce uh, my my grandfather was divorced. One doesn't have to come to America to be divorced. He divorced his wife, went to another country, Hungary, married another Jewish lady, thank God. And I, I, I am the but result of that second never. marriage. <laughs> Milton, why do you think you and I you know, have this relationship over the years? And, and you know, there's a, div there's a divorce in my deeply traditional Jewish background. Now, somehow, the Jewish community was at one time able to live with, and let me use a strong term, to sanctify divorce and the state of being divorced. One of our problems today is we not only divorce, but it is another secular act which destroys us Jewishly to reintegrate this old Talmudic Jewish necessity. That's a high job. Now, I don't think any major Jewish institution is going to deal with that. But maybe some people who are living through this and facing this and suddenly have a sense of values which says, hey, we got a problem here, maybe they could come up with something. Yes. See, well, but you see, the trouble was, as long as you said universalism, I didn't know what your political ideology was. Mm -hmm. If I now have to defend universalism as your particular political ideology, I'm going to be in all kinds of trouble. Because it sounds to me as if the only kind of universalism you know is a universalism which goes down a, a kind of left-wing line. Now, much of that, in fact, I personally approve of. But I'm very critical of that kind of thing today. I want to try to bring my Jewish values to bear on any liberal agenda given me. I no longer simply accept the liberal agenda as necessarily the Jewish agenda. That's why I need to know what I believe as a Jew and care about as a Jew because I am then able to try to distinguish as best I can, it's a hell of a job, between those general human issues which are really compelling to me as a Jew, those issues on which I no longer can be uh, uh, assured. I want to tell you when there's an issue about the security of the state of Israel as against some universal human concern and they conflict with one another in US policy, I am torn apart. And I should be torn apart. 
because I won't give up being a Jew, and I won't give up that general uh, 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 understanding and response. But I go back to my key issue. Once it was all so clear where the values came from. You read the Nation magazine or the New Republic. What's your problem? Then you found a verse in the Torah to match it, and you had Jewish ethics. Today, we're no longer sure, as a result of which we want to find some ground out of which we can know how to live. Now, we've got to talk about securing that ground. And my gravamen here is that finding those deep Jewish roots are the prerequisites for Jewish duty, which in my opinion certainly includes a universal duty, whether it carries through with your political program or not. Milton, would you like to? I think that was admirably yeah. well said. How about that, friends? <laughs> You've seen it here. <laughs> okay, on this, um, on this positive note, I'm afraid we'll have to call this evening to an end. There will be an opportunity, however, for us to ask questions, ask additional questions, since um, we have a reception which is in the room immediately joining us behind you. And we, welcome, we would like to ask everyone who'd like to stay to please join us for wine and refreshments. Uh, I frankly had, had planned an ending for this um, series with my associate, David Zoni. We'd gone through the whole scenario of what would happen tonight, and everything worked out differently than we expected because Milton Himmelfarb chose the only verse that I could possibly remember uh, oh, from, <laughs> from Malachi, since I remember having read the Haftorah, and also remember my friend Hillel Levine having used that verse at a, a Federation protest. Um, but since it's the only thing I have to end the thing, I'll have to end it with that. Uh, as Milton said, <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's Milton Malachi. <laughs> who didn't change his name. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet, and he will turn the heart of the fathers to their children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. I don't think Milton put the last part in about smiting the land with a curse. In any case, it's been a fascinating uh, four sessions, and I must admit that for me, this was probably the most rewarding um, because we had two very literate, intelligent, and sometimes disagreeing, but, but always exciting and stimulating thinkers, who've, both of whom have been my teachers and hopefully yours too, to put a kind of um, coda on what has been, uh, I think, an, an interesting and also frustrating four-part series. What we'd like to do, um, David Zoni and myself, and with the help of John Ruskay, is to edit the, um, the tapes that we've made of, of these four weeks, and to take out those elements which we think are most lasting, and then to, to use that as a basis of discussion uh, among some selected people, and take whatever comes out of all that, which will be perhaps uh, six months to a year from now, and use that as a way of uh, asking certain hard questions to, to this culture uh, while it's still young enough to answer them. Thank you very, very much for coming. Please join us in the reception. Thank you very much.